you know, this is our opportunity to really center the stories and the wisdom of the indigenous here. As you all know, there is a whole track programming indigenous at SOCAP. So please pay attention to that. And we're going to continue to dig deeper into that conversation this afternoon with our next, our next panel, uh, which includes Lourdes Inga, Executive Director of the International Funders for Indigenous Peoples. She is a social change agent. When I asked her what was on her mind, what was bringing her joy, she said, hope. You don't hear that much. And so I want to invite her to come to the stage. She's a Kawachua heritage, and we uh, honor whose land that we're standing on, that we're sitting on, that we're working on. And so you all welcome Lourdes Inga to the stage here. China Ching also joining us for this conversation as we continue to pull the thread to talk about uh, what's next and indigeneity and wisdom and, and wellness and money. China is the director of grant making for the Christensen Fund. She lives here in San Francisco, native Hawaiian, and you know, indigenous commitment to the well-being of all people and to this land. Please welcome her to the stage. Yes. <laughs> Joanne Carling, who is an indigenous activist who is from and still lives in the Philippines, in Cordillera, Philippines. And there is so much to say about her, but um, one of the things that I thought was beautiful is that she was just given the Lifetime Achievement Award from the UN Empowerment Program, and that is a huge thing to applaud. Um, and to thank her for her work. And then we have the moderator, Sean Paul, who um, really is just a brilliant social entrepreneur. And this fifth iteration of his brilliance, he is now the CEO uh, of Hijido Verde. Hijido means rural community. And he lives in uh, Michoacan, Mexico. When I asked him about joy backstage, he said, pulling the thread from moving money at the intersection of nature and sustainable rural livelihoods. And so he will be uh, sitting in space, holding space this afternoon, and we done wel welcome you to this stage and welcome this information and this wisdom. Thank you. Huh? Okay. Um, little technical difficulty here. We're just going to go roll with it. Uh, we did pre what we were preparing to share with you um, was a video about indigenous people uh, worldwide to give just a visual sense of uh, we're here together really um, celebrating and honoring our work as and with indigenous peoples uh, working with finance and business. And my name is Sean Paul. I'm the CEO of a Mexican regenerative forestry company, Ejido Verde, where we are a partnership between rural uh, Purepecha communities in Michoacan, Mexico, and an industry that together uh, provides ingredients for the world made from pine resin that everyone uses every day, everywhere. Uh, and in that role, I've really come to this work as a, my professional career working <clears throat> quite intimately at, with solutions for, with rural and indigenous communities. And I'm really, really honored and delighted by a really highly uh, distinguished and accomplished uh, panel that get to really uh, to share with all of you uh, some of our work and perspectives um, advancing well-being together with indigenous communities. And I'm hoping in lieu of um, the video that we had had uh, prepared for you. I'm hoping uh, Joan could share with us a little bit about why, what brings it together? Why is the world and why are you getting the attention of the United Nations um, to really look in a special way at, at the role and status of indigenous peoples? Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. I 
would like to start from my own experience in, in the Philippines on why I became an indigenous activist in the first place. While I was in college, there was a big um, project, a dumb project, that was uh, so, uh, going to displace more than 100,000 of indigenous peoples and also destroy thousands of hectares of rice fields and the forests. And this is because of the uh, construction of dams. And I, I, I've seen how people are willing to give up their life to protect their, their, their river because it's the source of their culture, it's the source of their livelihoods, it's the source of their identity. And from, from there, I also witnessed and, and, and joined demonstrations of mine, mining communities because of the, the pollution of their river from, uh, from the mining uh, operations, aside from uh, you know, the, the risk that workers are, 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 are facing, including having uh, low, low salaries. And, and fr fr from this, it's very clear to me that, w that when w we talk of, of uh, protecting the environment, we cannot isolate this from looking into the rights of these communities uh, mm -hmm. in, in the face of this kind of in investments that are actually not providing development for the people, but violating their rights and further marginalizing indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why we need to bring this to the attention of the global community, that, that indigenous peoples are there protecting our environment, but, but are being thrown out. Uh, our, their rights are violated, their dignity is trampled, genocide and ethnocide are taking all over the place, and this has to reach global attention. And that is why the United Nations finally, after more than 20 years of negotiations, adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And if you look at the data now, 60 to 80 percent of the uh, biodiversity of the world is in, the, in indigenous territories. And this is not coincidental. This is because indigenous peoples continue their stewardship role so that the future generation have something to, to live, in, live on. And if people are evicted from their land, then that role and contribution will not continue. So, so this is the reason why we have to bring this to the global attention, especially now that we're talking of sustainable development. But sustainable development, again, for who? So we need to be clear that it has to be anchored on human rights. It has to be anchored on the protection of environment. It has to be anchored in the sustainability of the only planet that we live in. Thank you. It's really a privilege for me. Uh, Joan has devoted her life and 30 years at the, on the global stage, not only as a grassroots activist, but she has really got the attention of the world's leaders to really think differently of how the world needs to be more inclusive of indigenous peoples that <clears> occupy, <throat> that uh, traditionally use and occupy about 60% of the Earth's uh, land surface. And I just wanted to ask China, you've now in your role in grant making at the Christensen uh, fund, a family foundation, you know, have seven years looking at working with indigenous people globally. Mm -hmm. And I'm really hoping you can sh share a bit about your, your own experience and mm -hmm. a little respond to jo Joan's comments. Yeah, well, I mean, it's always an honor to be uh, able to respond to Joan's comments. But I first want to, our, our wonderful um, moderator, acknowledge that we're on indigenous territory, but I also just wanted to say from this incredible place that we're sitting right now, we actually have this incredible ability to see the territories of all the Ohlone peoples in the Bay Area. So the Karkin, the Chichoni, the Ramatush, the Rumsin, and the Mutsin, and then to the north, the Coast Miwok. Um, so just to acknowledge whose uh, traditional territory we're all on. And I also wanted to acknowledge SOCAP for um, for having this in indigenous track and I think also for broadening a conversation around finance and investment and development. Um, but so we are actually a private foundation. Uh, we were, uh, we have, we've been around since 1957, but over the past 15 years we've focused on biocultural diversity. 
And so anytime someone comes to work with us, the first thing they have to learn is like, what is biocultural diversity? And essentially it's the relationship between people and place. And it really goes to what Joanne was talking about in terms of why do we have this remaining biodiversity in the world? And that is not an accident. That remaining biodiversity in the world comes because of relationships and it's relationships not only between plants and animals, um, but it's also relationships of people to those places and the incredible knowledge um, that has evolved from that. So just as a story, I was in Central Asia last week and uh, I got on an airplane and it was 75 degrees, which was easily 15 degrees wit warmer than it usually is at that time and 55 minutes Later, I got off an airplane and it was like 20 degrees and snowing, um, which was also very unusual. So I think we can acknowledge that we're in this place where we have to start th thinking differently about all of our relationships to the earth and not just, um, you know, because of the beauty and all of the bounty and the wisdom and the knowledge that comes in those relationships, but. I mean, selfishly for our own survival, we're in a place where we have to think differently about that. And that includes all of our sectors. Uh, so I think for us, that's been a place that as philanthropy, I think around the investment, we're in a different place. We're on the grant making side of things, but trying to rethink economies and rethink economies, not just on traditional GDP, but really rethinking economies on relationships and how all of that, uh, all of that uh, relationship that happens between people and place we can use as redefining our well-being. Thank you. Uh, Laura, this, uh, you're, you're currently our executive director of International Funders for Indigenous Peoples. At your heritage is Quechua heritage from the central Andean region of Peru. Can you share with us a little bit your journey to get to Peru to, to what you're doing today, leading an international organization. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you, Sean. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be in the same space as Joanne in China and Sean, and with all of you here. Um, so yeah, my name is Lourdes Singh. I'm um, Director of International Funders for Indigenous Peoples. And my own journey is very personal. Um, if you're familiar with Latin America, it's a very much colonized region. Uh, that includes um, colonized minds, including myself. Um, so the journey to really kind of embrace and actually own my heritage um, took some time. Um, but I'm nevertheless very proud of, uh, of celebrating uh, where I come from, um, where my father's family comes from. And so moving now to present day, I direct uh, the only global uh, philanthropy network that focuses on indigenous peoples. Um, we are really at the core of transforming funding relationships um, between uh, philanthropy and also impact investors like yourself and indigenous peoples uh, to move to one of uh, mutual understanding, respect, um, and benefit. And we do this through um, core values, uh, core values that are very much rooted uh, on indigenous values. Um, um, International Funders for Indigenous Peoples a few years ago really um, sort of launched the, um, what it's referred to as the four R's of uh, philanthropy which is uh, respect, responsibility, reciprocity, and relationships. And these are really values that, as a network of funders, we encourage our members to embrace and incorporate, um, not only in the practical sense on how do they actually do that in sort of their grant giving or, or the impact investing, but really kind of uh, owning it as members of a global community. Um, and then, um, you know, I think these are values that are also very transferable and very um, directly applicable to this audience as well. 
um, when you're thinking of impact investments and partnerships with indigenous communities, you know, these values should be at the center as well as um, applying an indigenous rights uh, lens to impact investing. Yeah, thank you. I think one of the things we were talking about and preparing ourselves uh, here, and I really think uh, it's my belief as a participant at SOCAP for many years, one of the things we're really looking at as a crisis of values. We have good values of our last mm -hmm. century that guided our, our economy that might be characterized in one way as maximize short time prof profits by any means possible. Mm -hmm. And here you're offering another set of values of the four, four R's um, guiding how, how, how funders are coming together uh, to, to move money. In my work in Mexico at Hido Verde with Puro Pecha, we, we think deeply into the value of reciprocity. How are we moving money and investing in communities to restore degraded lands? Uh, and reciprocity for us is about what does it mean to be in value creating uh, relationships between individuals, families, communities, uh, our relationship with the earth, investors, industry, and government. And in, as a member of uh, International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, I've seen this relationship of reciprocity come up in indigenous traditions around the world. And I'm hoping you can share with me a bit, in your view, how do you see uh, might reciprocity value how we move money at the intersection of markets and meaning? Yeah, l let me just cite an example where in, in a lot of the indigenous communities that I visited, uh, the, the, the reciprocity and, and uh, value of, of sharing can be seen from, say, we treat, uh, when, when we use the, the forest, we make sure that we don't cut so much trees that will affect the other wildlife or the watershed, for example. Mm -hmm. We use that, but in return, the forest is providing us what we need, but we make sure that it, 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 it sustains. The other one in terms of, 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 of the sharing is when communities have surplus in their product, in, in their, for example, fruit trees in the village, they will get what they need and they put the rest of their harvest on the side of the road so that others can share mm. that fruit. Mm -hmm. What do we learn from that? That what, what, we need, what we get is what we need and beyond what we need is what we share. And, and I, I think if we, if we look at in investing in that sense, it may, it's going beyond selfishness. It's going beyond not only thinking, what can I get or what good do I do, but what kind of change and empowerment do I create? Mm -hmm. And for me, I look at this as more a relationship of co-stewardship of partnership that is based on making the other party as powerful as you are. Mm -hmm. It's changing also the power dynamics where respect for each other mm -hmm. in a reciprocal way is mm -hmm. built in into mm -hmm. that kind of, 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 of partnership. Mm -hmm. and, and it's already clear, like, why are there still huge gaps in the implementation, for example, of the Sustainable Development Goals? because there is no accompanying redistribution of wealth. The gap of inequality remains the same. Wealth is still concentrated in the hands of the, of the few. It's not shared. Mm. And that is because greed persists to be the dominating value of a lot of people. And if we don't look at the lens of indigenous peoples where value is something that we share, something that is based on solidarity and cooperation, we will not get there. And the challenge that we face now, even if we're talking of, so, of social investing, for example, is how do we, how can that change the power relations? How can we, in fact, bring power to communities and not to disempower them? by elevating their capacity to participate in decision-making through their economic empowerment. So it's not enough to just build economic empowerment, but more so, how are they participating in decision-making that make sure that the wealth of the earth is shared, that there is sustainability in wh when we pursue development that is shared by all. So, that is, I, I think, what we need to, to consider or reflect uh, upon. Mm -hmm. 
Joan, I'm sorry, I want to just follow up on that. Mm -hmm. and, and when we look at the challenges, you also, one of the things we've talked about are opportunities. With all those challenges, what are the solutions you're working on? And I'm particularly interested in your, the Renewable Energy Partnership uh, yes. that you've recently yes. launched at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, 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 first of all, we need to think that, that indigenous peoples, marginalized communities are not just victims. They are actually development actors. We have our own skills. We also have our knowledge to share. And that's, that, that, that we are contributing. So from the perspective of, of indigenous peoples, there are already innovations for sustainable resource management, for food security, which we are providing to the world. But now that we are also facing a crisis in, in, in the climate, we need to also act together to provide solutions. And indigenous peoples are very much committed to the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy. However, if we don't do it right, like a lot of solar uh, and windmill farms are still violating our rights because we are being displaced. We are not part of the decision making that is this an appropriate form that will actually lead to, uh, to greater access of power if on the one hand we're actually causing the marginalization of indigenous peoples. So we need to frame renewable energy from a rights perspective, from a social equity perspective, because that is the way we can work together and find the solution. It's a partnership that should be based on respect for rights, respect for our gender equality, empowerment of community, and sharing our resources and sharing the stewardship of the planet so that we can combat climate change, but at the same time providing sustainable livelihoods and economic empowerment to women and communities as we find the solution or act or provide the solution to climate change. Give me one example of a pro one of the projects in this initiative. What, what does it look like? Yes, uh, the, the one that we have in, in Sabah, Malaysia, is that the, the indigenous experts that we have already on renewable energy are building appropriate microhydro from, you know, recycling aluminum to, to, to what is appropriate in the community and even combining this with solar because of the, the nature of communities that, and the weather. When it's raining too, too much, then the, it's a micro. Uh, hydro that works better, and if there's so much sun, then it's mm -hmm. it's the solar, and this in, a, in the community, and these are community owned, the, and it has empowered women by providing them uh, economic uh, livelihood, but also the independence that was brought by that, and enable them to participate in decision making. It has also highlighted the necessary role of protecting watershed because it's the watershed providing water for the micro. Mm -hmm. So the, you, you, you see that we need to look at also how do we take care of the resources that provides this kind of, of, uh, of energy that benefits uh, the communities uh, as a whole. So, it, so that, that's one ex example that, that, that I, can, I can share to you. There's, other examples of, of also communities inno innovating on, in terms of uh, the food systems. We provide a lot of indigenous varieties of seeds, and now they are under threat because of climate change. So we need to find ways and means on also how, to, how do we address food security of, of indigenous uh, communities. So there are techniques using our tra traditional knowledge. So there's actually a, now a revival of traditional knowledge because through this, we're able again to, uh, to, uh, to plant more of our indigenous varieties and transfer the knowledge to the next generation so that they can continue to do that role of providing not only food security for indigenous peoples, but also for others in society. Mm. So and at Hito Verde, what we're seeing in terms of what is a, some of the solutions look like, building transformative wealth for rural communities that are creating, creating jobs in the community, restoring the planet, and they're in an integrated supply chain where industry is benefiting, investors are benefiting, providing specialty ingredients to the world. 
So we're working toward these win-win-win solutions. China, I'm wondering in your work, have you been really working around the world with indigenous peoples, what do solutions look like uh, in, with investors in business um, and indigenous peoples? Uh, thanks. You know, so I will be honest. I think that as a foundation, you know, you have this incredible luxury and privilege of, of choosing the ways that uh, you make grants. And I think, to be honest, a lot of our work was around resisting capitalism. Uh, so trying to help communities uh, maintain traditions. But I think our early way that we looked at about that was like, how do you keep things out? And I think one of the big lessons that we've learned, because I think this is, to be completely honest, I think it's a, it's a struggle, right? I think that, that what capitalism has done is it's created our role, it's, cha it's changed our relationship to one of consumer. If we're gonna talk about reciprocity, it's acknowledging that it's a relationship of relationships, which is different than being a consumer. And so I think, you know, for us, I think we're actually still learning about that. I think probably uh, in our work, the acknowledgement of the role that economies play has, is, I think we're probably behind on how we think about that. But I will share for me what was my biggest breakthrough as someone who naturally does not uh, think in terms in like in, in economic uh, frameworks for better or worse. So for me, one of the biggest breakthroughs was there's a community, a, 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 a series of, of Maya communities in Belize who have been fighting to regain their territory for an incredibly long time, like 16 years. And um, the state had been doing extraction on their land, so all of their energy had been focused on how do we get our territory back, how do we get our territory back, how do we get our territory back. So they won the, the legal battle, they got their territory back, and immediately the first question for them was, well, what do we do about an economy? Because if we don't think about an economy, we're gonna be put in the same vulnerable situation where we'll have to lease our land for extraction. So for me, this was a really interesting uh, you know, uh, discussion. And what, what they did was they were also saying that they didn't necessarily need to also transition to capitalist values. So what they said is they reframed economy, one, as a governance issue. So how are we using economies as a way to better uh, have relationships and stewardships of our land? And the second thing is they redefined profit as what keeps our community together, which for me has been really helpful in the way of trying to think about uh, these opportunities that we have in, in redefining relationships and actually, actually defining economies as a series of relationships. We have uh, less than a minute left, Lord. This I'm just hoping you might share briefly, are there some high-level work that you see happening among the members of International Funders for Indigenous People around solutions mm -hmm. the intersection of money and meaning? Sure, I think, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think I started it when, when they were asking me how to introduce myself and, and, and hope was very much on my mind because I'm just coming from having held our own conference in Santa Fe a couple of, week, a couple of weeks ago, going to then to Mexico City to the Human Rights uh, Funders Conference and then to another event. And I think all throughout, and including our members at International Funders for Indigenous Peoples, um, what I see is a sort of a real kind of um, rethinking of philanthropy. Um, and I hope also this audience here, Impact Investors, of really um, working um, with um, local uh, initiatives. Uh, mm -hmm. initiatives and solutions that are coming from the bottom up rather than from the top down. Because I think those, particularly those solutions that are coming from the bottom up, do address a lot of what's on people's mind in terms of real social change and transformation, not only for us as philanthropists or impact investors, but more, more so uh, for those communities that are trying to really transform their communities and ensure that their rights 
are respected across the board, regardless of who they are interacting with, with uh, the local governments or in impact investors. So the net, um, I, uh, International Funders for Indigenous Peoples as a global community does you know, create this space for our members to come together and, and have conversations about not only how do you do this uh, through a grant making vehicle, of giving, but also, you know, really rethinking how they're doing it also through um, their, you know, total portfolio um, through infant investing and other ways of supporting um, initiatives like the Right Energy Partnership. Thank you. We need to wrap up. I want to first, uh, finally, thank SOCAP for really shining a light on innovations and opportunities to invest together with indigenous peoples. I really want to thank our speakers from coming great distances to really come and share with us uh, a glimpse of their wisdom on this topic and their passions. We'll have more opportunities to speak with our guests uh, tonight at 6.30 at the Impact Hub Clubhouse. You're all invited to a reception there. Friday, there are more panels, including one at 11 o'clock mm -hmm. with our panelists, where I really mm -hmm. invite you to consider consider diving deeper in the topics we've shared with you right now. Thank you. Thank you.